you've got to stay on your game and you've definitely got to be adaptive. For those of you who know me, you absolutely know that I love fishing in Yellowstone Teton territory in eastern Idaho. Oh my gosh. <laughs> nice. So we came up on this channel. We saw a big brown trout chasing bait. So we came back to try to see if we can get him put on a streamer. And we got him. Well, I love it so much. We're back again fishing the main river of the snake with Keegan Barrett, a guide out of the lodge at Palisades Creek. Look at that. Oh my gosh. This big fish adventure starts right now on the new Fly Fisher. Ooh, that's a nice sized fish. Absolutely fantastic. Good fish. The new Fly Fisher is supported by Visit Idaho Yellowstone Teton Territory Orvis Fly Fishing Scientific Anglers Trout Unlimited WeatherTech Canada Welcome to the banks of the South Fork of the Snake River. Welcome to the Lodge at Palisades Creek. Just downstream from Palisades Reservoir, this angling oasis is home to trout hunters from all over the world. Located in Irwin, Idaho, southeast of Swan Valley in Yellowstone Teton Territory, the Lodge at Palisades Creek sits on over 20 acres with private cabins for all guests. This trip, we are staying at the A-frame, aptly called the South Fork House. With a cantilever deck over the South Fork of the Snake, this extremely well-appointed cabin is warm and welcoming. The Lodge at Palisades Creek holds permits to guide the South Fork of the Snake River, a world-class, excellent system that boasts over 5,000 fish per mile. What is unique about the lodge is they also have one of two permits in the state to fish the main Snake River. The main snake begins where the Henry's Fork and the South Fork converge. It's unique in its makeup and sees very little angling pressure. Part of the reason for such low pressure is there are very few boat ramps on this section of the snake. making drift boats very difficult to use. So on this trip, we're fishing a very different system. We're fishing out of a jet boat with Lodge at Palisades Creek guide, Keegan Barrett. Hi, I'm Keegan Barrett, guide with Lodge at Palisades Creek, and this is my jet boat. It's a Clacker Craft Magnum. It's a kind of a hybrid between a jet boat typical aluminum sled and a drift boat. It runs a 60 horse, 40 output jet motor, which means it's a 60 horse motor. The jet foot takes a little bit of power away from them, so it only ends up about 40 horse output. With the light fiberglass boat, it gets up on plane, go about two inches of water. It can get you in a lot of places that you can't get with other boats. The big advantage of a jet boat is it opens up a lot more waters. You can get into still water fishing with it. You can get into the main channel of the snake where there aren't enough takeouts to float a drift boat with. So that opens up about 100 miles of water that's inconvenient to use a drift boat with. It's got seats for two. It's got rod racks, dry storage, room for a cooler, leg braces in front and back and a flat bottom, which makes it very easy to move around in. They're a lot of fun and opens up a lot of world. Another day here in Eastern Idaho, and uh, man, the whole ride here, all you were talking about was how much you love this section of river. Tell me about it. Yeah, this, this section is, is uh, it's my favorite this time of year because we can get into everything. We can get into streamer fishing, nymph fishing if we have to, and if everything comes together right, we get a we get a small PMD hatch here. Right. 
there's spots that we can come down here and we can sit and catch fish for two to three hours without moving. Really? Yes. On dry flies? On dry flies. On dry flies, on PMDs, um, we swing soft tackles, which is so much fun in itself. Okay. Once again, we're on the main snake. It's not crowded. Right. There, there's very little competition and it's just a blast. All right, well, let's get this loaded and have some fun for the day. Yeah, buddy. We set up at our first spot. Trico's on the water. We just might see some heads. This is perfect. Fishing from a jet boat is a unique experience and differs from that of a drift boat. With the anchor in the bow, you fish from the stern of the boat. There is ample room and the leg locks are forward enough anglers can decide whether or not to use them. In Keegan's jet boat, he is facing the stern, whereas in a regular drift boat, the guide generally faces the bow. You have to be mindful of tangles on the tiller handle, but all in all, it's quite roomy and offers the ability for forecast as well as backcast, left-handed or right. Though we did see a few fish taking trichos this morning, we just couldn't get close enough to them. As we moved in, they'd keep the same distance, pushing away from the boat. Totally fun. Totally frustrating. So we pick up and hit the main Snake River. I like to throw it straight across the current here uh -huh. and let it swing down in through it. there and bring it back okay. as well as what you're doing. Try to work both currents. Oh, you're on. I'm on. Got a rainbow. <laughs> you're saying one more and then we'll switch to the fly yeah, up? Yeah. I don't think we need to, little guy. No, no, we're good. So we're sitting in this pool. There's a confluence river here. And uh, nice. And there's a deep, deep, deep pool here and there's a bunch of carp swimming around. Um, and this is perfect because it's got food coming in from both directions, settles in, nice deep spot for protection and home to this nice little rainbow. So what I'm doing is I'm just casting it out on the drop of this, this big hole. It's a barbell-eyed, little clouser-looking fly, and then starting to strip back once I count it down. Remo. There we go, hey. got him. I knew this place looked fishy, didn't uh -huh. it? Huh? I got a gravel bar, a little slough in the back, some, some debris. Oh, he came off. Oh. Yeah, get it back there. There's gonna be another one in there. Damn, that was a good fish too. Yeah, it was. Just before lunch, Keegan suggests we head downriver as the PMD hatch just might go off in a short while. So we pack up and get set to headhunt. In the fall, around noon on this river, in some choice locations, a small pale morning dun hatch comes off. As we wait, a few begin to pop. We just need a degree or two more of warmth to really get things rocking. If you get a chance to take a little time while you're out fishing, good thing to do is start turning over logs and rocks and sticks inside the water. What that's gonna do is that's gonna tell you exactly the size and the color of the nymphs or the, the bug life that the fish are eating. So you can pick them up and just watch around and just pick them out and match your fly to what's in the environment that you're fishing. This is the reason why fish hang out where they're at. You know, on a short, shallow gravel bar like this, that's got a pour over or a dump off, a bucket on the edge of it, they're hanging there because under all these rocks, it's just this huge buffet of bug life. And as they break loose from the rocks, they flow down into the hole and the fish eat them. So 
take some time to do that. It can make you a better fisherman and a better fly tire. So what happens is those bugs live down in the gravel in these shallow beds. And when they're ready to hatch, when they feel they're ready, they create an oxygen bubble and they let go of the rock. And that helps them rise to the surface. And as they get to the surface, just like a caterpillar out of a cocoon, their shell will split open and they'll crawl out. And as they come to the surface of the water, they'll fly away. So because of that can't happen just instantly, there's a moment there where they're sitting at the surface of the water trying to hatch and come off and getting, getting their wings unfolded and so they can fly away. And the fish key in on that and that's when they come in and they eat them. And so they'll stack up into these places just like this where we're at and eat till the bugs are done. So I've got a unique situation here fishing rainbows and cutthroat on the main Snake River here in eastern Idaho. I want to fish the trough that's on the other side of all of this riffle and run. It's a long cast and there's a lot of different speeds of current that are in front of me. The object is to get the bubble and the nymphs to drift down at a uniform speed and not be have unnecessary drag. So how do you do that? You use something called a reach cast. And what a reach cast is, is it's a cast that sets up your mend while the flies are still in the air. It takes a little bit of practice, but once you get it, it's a vital cast to be able to ensure that maybe you get two, three, four feet of a drag-free drift, or maybe it's enough that you can get a 12 or 15 or a hero drift in. But a reach cast is something that will really, really help you. And here's how you do it. Get your flies in the air. And just before you're about to present, reach with your fly line and your rod tip upstream. That puts a belly in the line and allows that rig system to drift down naturally. So again, get your flies in the air, where you want to cast. It's a long cast, it's probably 60 feet for me, and then a reach out. And that gives me, that was a good one, that probably, that will probably give me, you know, 25 or 30 feet of a drag free drift. So a reach cast, when you need to get something at a long distance presented, it's one that can actually make you reach your target and catch fish. On the strip, I was done with my drift and I started to uh, <laughs> bring the flies in and uh, this little dude came and ate it. Now the funny thing is, Keegan, is that's exactly what's supposed to happen, right? It's exactly. Because those nymphs are coming up, they're emerging, and the, and the fish want to eat them. They, yeah, they come up and they're looking for those, at that, that's that weak spot in that bug's life. He right. has no protection. He can't crawl below the rocks. He can't fly away into the air as they're from between the surface and they're, they're stuck. They're food. That's all they are. Right. So the cool thing is, is that's a six inch fish, but it's the same behavior with a 30 inch fish. They act yes. all the same. Yes. There goes. <laughs> that thing was fast. <laughs> the lodge at Palisades Creek is a very well-revered fishing lodge in eastern Idaho. Full amenities welcome anglers of all ages and abilities. Guides are excellent, with most guiding out of the lodge for decades. Log cabins are rustically luxurious with each one with a deck looking out at the south fork of the snake. We're staying at the A-frame, also known as the South Fork House. It's a large two-bedroom, two-bathroom cabin with a deck over the river. Lots of room inside to sit and visit in a well-appointed living room with a wet bar and small refrigerator. Large glass windows offer exquisite views of the river and the lodge is all-inclusive with incredible meals both on and off the river. We didn't get those extra degrees of warmth we needed for the PMD hatch to go off, so we decided to switch things up and target river structure in search of fish. And boy,
boy, did that decision pay off. The challenge that I have in fishing this log jam is a couple of things. Now, I'm nymphing it, which means I've got two, maximum three nymphs under an indicator. As you cast, your line, your bobber, and your nymphs are all gonna be in a straight line. So you have to place your cast with the accuracy of your final nymph. You can't place your cast with the accuracy of your bobber. Because if the indicator goes too close, the nymphs are gonna hook up. It takes a little bit of practice, and one of the things that you can do is a slight sidearm cast where at the very end, you pull the flies back and it whips the flies parallel to the structure movement. That's one thing you can do. The other thing is just go inch by inch in and try to get it as close as you can. Ultimately, the closer you can get it, the better chance you have of hooking up the fish that are living in there that will come out, dart out to eat your nymphs. So it's, it takes a little bit of work, it takes a little bit of practice, but once you can get in the zone, and you get really close, chances are if there's a fish in there, it's gonna eat. Nice fish. Like that. Look at that. So we've been waiting for these uh, PMDs to go off after lunch. And uh, the bugs seem to have really sort of died off, which is unfortunate. But uh, we put the bubble rig back on, pulled this guy out of the log jam. Now, you do say, Keegan, that it's a quality game down here, isn't it? Yes, it's it's not necessarily, you know, having those 100 fish days are nearly unheard of. I'm not saying it can't happen, but more of these fish are bigger fish. That's the main thing about the whole, the biggest thing, the coolest thing about the main. Skier it to you, nice, oh. nice stab. Great fish, man. Another one, nice. <laughs> Log jams, they pay. Yeah, right He's there. He's running up river. In that feed line. He's gonna pull the anchor, Keegan, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing, the trick, the trick with this, and it's a risky trick, right? Because you've gotta you've got to risk the flies to get to where they are. You, you have to, it, it, it's, you gotta go into it expecting to lose some flies, because if you don't. It's not where they live. Usually you're not gonna be close enough. Nice crab. In order to keep the slime on, the protective slime on fish, it's best to handle them without a glove and to have your hand wet. Well, on a high gunneled boat, it's not a case on a, on a drift boat like this, but on a high gunneled boat, you know, sometimes it's difficult and it, it might go overboard if you go to get your hands wet. So all you do is lift your fish up in the net, tap the bottom, and now that fish is protected, the slime is protected from coming off because your hands are wet. Nice fish. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good fish too. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh, 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 Holy. Oh, oh. <laughs> Jeez. What the heck just happened? You want to run after him here? He's gone all the way down to the reservoir. <laughs> he's going to that wood is what he's doing. Not this again. No, he's at, He's not in it. Okay. Oh no, he's just a he's, big fish. That's just yeah. He's just that's a just toad. a bruiser. He's in the mouth. Took off like a cannon oh, oh, too. Did I ever hear that? Hear that rooster? The line. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Oh. oh, what a fantastic fish! Are you kidding? Wild rainbow on the Snake River. <laughs> oh, what a stud! <laughs> What a fantastic fish. Are you kidding me right now? So on these log jams that have been here for a while, water will erode out in front of and beside them and it creates a pocket. And it can be a couple feet deep to four, five, six feet deep. And those fish like to get down in those pockets for a couple of reasons. One, there's a back eddy where it's less effort for them to stay holding in one spot. The other reason is it also creates shade and cover for them, which is shade from the sun and protection from eagles and osprey. So another reason why is 
as the current flows next to the jam, that food will congregate into that seam and they can just sit in that soft pocket water and reach over and grab a bite to eat as something comes floating by. Ideally, what you want to do is cast above upstream from the obstacle as close as you can get it without snagging up. Now that's going to take some trial and error because you can't see what's underneath the water. So throw it above, let it go through. If it doesn't hang up, get it a couple inches closer and a couple inches closer. And hopefully you'll catch a fish before you catch a stick. And before we know it, our good day turned into a great day. Look at the size of this football. Now that's a brown bass if I ever saw one. That's a great fish. Fishing the main Snake River below Idaho Falls, the lower sections, you should always be prepared because you never quite know what you're going to catch. Whatever it is, it just crushed this fly. I don't know what it is. Well, it's shark on a, it's Look right here. Look at that, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> but it felt like an eat. It didn't feel yeah. like, it didn't feel like a hook. Well, no, he doesn't. He's not acting like he's foul hooked right now at all. Big oh, carp. Is a carp. Big giant carp on a streamer. Holy, it's a mirror carp. <laughs> you say they will eat streamers though, right? We have had them eat streamers. The last thing you think they would do, but they will do it. This guy must have taken a swipe at it and missed. Old rubber lips. They're doing the tuna death spiral. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> this That's is a way so to crazy. build a net. Oh. <laughs> you know, we gotta bring the boat. <laughs> Mirror carp, they're beautiful fish. Look at the rudder. Yeah, the, the propeller is <laughs> huge. <laughs> What's really cool is this is how they, see the barbels right there? That's how they feel around for all kinds of little crustaceans and things. What a great fish, so fun. The next day, we decide to put in a little upstream on the snake, just below the confluence of the Henry's Fork and the South Fork. This is the beginning of the main Snake River. Today's objective, to target cutthroat and brown trout. We begin the day off throwing streamers for aggressive fish, and Keegan has some advice. So we're fishing these shallow flats right now, and up on the bank it's real shallow and sometimes even as little as six inches deep. As it comes out at a shallow grade, there's a shelf somewhere along the line that'll drop off and make it a couple feet deeper. And if you throw it up onto the shallow and strip that back, give it a couple strips and paws and a couple strips and paws and get that lost look or injured look, makes them feel vulnerable to the fish and they'll come up and they'll get it. A lot of the time they'll eat it on the dead drift. You'll pause and let it dead drift through there. They'll eat it then or after you start stripping again, they think it's gonna get away from them so they'll take it then real hard. But they'll get up here and in these flats like that, it's gravel bottoms and chase the sculpins getting ready to fatten up for winter for the cutthroats and rainbows or the browns are getting fattened up getting ready for the spawn because that's coming very soon it's that time of year fish that's a good one did we finally find a spot we found a fish we hey, found him so we've been fishing all morning and uh haven't done anything so we moved and uh i've missed two fish and Keegan just roped our first fish of the day. <laughs> Good job, buddy, that's awesome. But this looks very productive. The great thing about this boat 
is that we can put this down, go to the far side of the bank, and go back up and do it again. Let's take a look at this fish. Great cutthroat. Perfect. Orange fins. Spots concentrated towards the back of the fish. Pure red. Yeah, very nice fish. So it's been tough today. It's uh, We've had several different factors going on this week. We've had a lot of water flow changes. We've had a lot of temperature changes. And one, or one of those in itself can have an effect on the fishing, let alone both of them happening all at once. And our flow changes have been pretty drastic. It's about a 50% drop down here where we're fishing. So that's a big environmental impact on the fish. So we're gonna try running a a little bit of a nymph rig. It's been raining this week. Hopefully maybe a little wire worm pattern will work and run some bubbles and see if that work. Catch us something. Ooh, there's a fish. That looks like a decent one. Tell me it's a rainbow. It is a rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good it's a good rainbow. <laughs> so we've had to it. we've had to adjust ourselves here. Uh, it's been a tough day. We've had to do something that, you know, neither Keegan and I are massive fans of, but you know, when, when you're not catching fish, you got to do something. So we put on a, uh, a nymph rig and it looks like it took the, it took the bullet at the bottom, Keegan. Yeah. Which is great. He just, he just saw you and decided to run. <laughs> and nymphing, I mean, I, I enjoy nymphing. Don't get me wrong. I like catching fish. Yeah. Right? So, but if, if, if this is the way you got to do it, this is the way you got to do it. Exactly. There's nothing wrong with it. No, there's not. It's just not my And this is a fantastic, a fantastic rainbow. You were saying just before this fish ate that these fish are really colored up here uh -huh. along this mud bank. He looks like a little mini steelhead, to be honest with you. And now he's, in, he's caught. He's hung up. So I'm going to give him some slack. Yeah, he's hung up. Do you want to jump on the motor maybe? Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's do that. So he dove straight to the bottom and has got hooked up on something. So we're gonna go chase it. That's the beautiful thing of having one of these jet motors. We can go up and see if we can get him free. I was just gonna say, you know, we got some debris coming up. Yeah. <laughs> trying to keep him up. Oh. That's the only thing left to try is go over the other side. Okay. I'll go that way and I'll just go up, just kind of go up over me. It's never happened to me before. I wish I could say. <laughs> it happens in this, down in this type of water, it happens all the time because it's such a... Debris filled. Yeah, I mean, everything that you're seeing out in here... Is down below. Is down below us too. Oh, I got him. Yes. He's free. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he's off now. Oh, he gets to the surface and comes loose. Oh. That's all right. We know where they're at now. That was exciting. I've never had that happen before, but he makes a good point, Keegan does, that the stuff that you see here along the shoreline and, you know, when the water's low is the stuff that's actually on the bottom. So. Yeah, you know? this whole river for 30 miles is, is riddled just like this. Right. All over, and this is only just a small fraction of what... Right. Yeah, the whole riverbank looks like they're at the bottom. Well, the good news, the good news is that the nymph came off, which means the fish is not hung up no, in the not. tree. So he's good. There we go. That's a fish. Another one. Same, same area, spot. right? Exact same spot. Yep. Right off that. Yep. Right off that debris field, and it took that bottom, that big heavy tungsten, that feed again. Yeah. Another good fish, silver one. This one. Yeah. 
You guys know the program. You're taking me back into that debris field, aren't you? <laughs> That's a good one, Keegan. Oh, you mean dirty. Oh, there we go. Okay, I got, I got fish. Oh, pretty fish, man. Wow. See what I mean? The pink on them? Yeah. It's just, I don't, it's, it's cool. They're kind of, it's pretty intense down those fish down here. That's a beautiful fish. Afternoon beauty. Look at the white tips on its fins, hey, Keegan? So distinct. Just gorgeous. All right, so here's the rig that we're using to catch these rainbows this afternoon um, here on the Snake River. Uh, we've got a small little um, uh, indicator here that's, that's movable, slidable, perfect for, for adjusting your depth as you need. We've got probably six feet of leader material to our first fly, which is like a pink head, uh, looks, looks almost like a, uh, a prince nymph. Um, little nymphy kind of thing. It's got some, some flash in it and some, uh, you know, that pink head that is supposed to be so attractive. And then this is the one that's doing it. It's a big brass headed quill, a bullet uh, with green and a little bit of a tail. Uh, it's, it's a paragon, so it's barbless. Uh, all, all these flies are barbless, actually. Uh, but it's a jig head style, so it has got that big head, sinks quickly, and uh, right now, this is the fly that these fish are loving. Equipment for this main Snake River adventure in Yellowstone Teton territory out of the lodge at Palisades Creek is as follows. We were wielding five and six weight, nine foot fly rods with matching five and six weight, weight forward floating lines for the indicator rig and five and six weight intermediate lines for our streamers. Leader material was a 12 foot 3X tapered leader for indicators and a four foot 0X leader for streamers. Well, the bobber rig was definitely the piece to the puzzle on this trip, and as the day wore on, we decided to switch to a hopper dropper, just to see if they'd play. There's a fish. Hey! So we changed up our rig once again to a, uh, a hopper dropper, and we pulled this rainbow off a, off a, v, a piece of V-structure, and um, And I learned a lesson on that other one, man. You gotta watch for debris downstream. <laughs> but that was funny, the, the, the hopper didn't even go under, it just paused, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, you gotta, that's, that's another reason. I think it's a brown trout. It is a brown. Nice. Nice fish. There you go. So when things are slow, make the decision, make the switch. Yeah, don't it's be proud. It's a nymphing, don't be proud. Of, yeah. <laughs> it's a good problem to have here. I'll, I'll grab that if you want to jump on the oars. <laughs> All right, so take a look at this brownie. Fly is out. That bullet seems to be doing the trick. Look at that. Beautiful fish. Not a giant, but you know what? On slow days, I'll take these all day long. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Huh. Kind of a hunchback on him. Yeah, he's, he's fixing to grow big. Yeah. He's not that far out. Is that him moving water right yep, there? Yeah, that is. We decided to make one more move back to the top of the confluence for one more float for the day. This is him still right here, yeah? Yeah. Keegan spotted a big fish in very shallow water hunting bait. He's out further? No, I think you're just, I think you're coming in right on him. I think I'm coming in too high. I, think, I can't believe he wouldn't just come get it though. Boy, he was running and eating it like that. Keegan tied on a streamer, and then this happened. There he is. <laughs> nice. So we came up on this channel, and uh, we saw a big brown trout chasing bait. Oh my gosh. So we came back to try to see if we can get him put on a streamer, 
And we got him. I need to watch out for this wood, man. Let's go north of it. What'd you tie on, Keegan? A uh, little natural colored mini dungeon. Uh-oh. This is funny. You've roped yourself, too. Right, I'm free now. And we saw this fish going crazy, chasing bait. Oh, he's going to net him. Yes! <laughs> we saw this fish going crazy, chasing bait over here. And uh, put on a streamer. And he came and ate it. He actually ate it. <laughs> Look at that. Oh my gosh. Can I give you that? Absolutely. <laughs> what an absolute thrill. You ready? Take a look at this. How long can we bide our time for dreams we never planned? Yeah. Brown shirt on a streamer. Sight casting. Perfect. When the sky said the winter time is coming on And you cry to see a shadow babe It's growing long Cross along another song Well, that about does it for this episode of The New Fly Fisher. Thanks for watching. I want to take this opportunity to thank Keegan Barrett, Justin Hayes, and everyone at the lodge at Palisades Creek for their hospitality and amazing fishing. Remember, adventure is out there. All you need to do is go and find it, and what better way than to do it with a fly rod in your hand? For more on the show, check us out at thenewflyfisher.com. For everyone here at The New Fly Fisher, thanks for watching. My name's Mark Melnick, and hopefully one day we'll see you in the great rivers of Yellowstone Teton Territory in eastern Idaho. The New Fly Fisher is supported by Visit Idaho Yellowstone Teton Territory Orvis Fly Fishing Scientific Anglers Trout Unlimited WeatherTech Canada